thanks very much for having me here to speak. It's a great honour and really a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, I have been extremely fortunate in my relatively short career to have lived and worked in different countries around the world and to have witnessed firsthand how inspirational individuals and communities have collaborated and innovated in very different ways to address and overcome some of the sustainability challenges that they feel and experience most urgently. Um, I'm now lucky enough to work here at the University of Sussex with a group which actually makes it their business to understand these processes and to try and enhance their effectiveness. The STEP Centre, which is drawn from SPRU, uh, that's Science and Technology Policy Research, and also the Institute for Development Studies here, looks at social, technological and environmental pathways to sustainability. Now, we're interested in sustainability at the global level. Uh, for instance, where scientific evidence suggests that our current patterns of development are putting at risk our future opportunities for, future, for further ongoing development. But at the same time, we also understand that the concept of sustainability, what is to be sustained by who and for whom, actually varies massively across the world, across the diverse planet that we live in. And we don't see reconciling these challenges, these different understandings of sustainability as a scientific problem, necessarily, so much as a political problem. But we think that the social sciences has a role to play in this, and we are working towards the goal of understanding these different forms of sustainability and trying to help different groups and communities work together towards their shared goals. The STEP Centre draws upon what we call our pathways approach. And we try to understand how different social, technological and environmental systems co-evolve in specific particular directions across time. That's what we see as um, the meaning of pathways. Uh, we understand that in some cases, these different systems reinforce each other and ge generate a momentum and they become dominant over other pathways. So here we can think of things like centralised thermal power or the way that the vast majority of us, in this country at least, use private motor vehicles in our mobility. These, we see, these pathways we see as huge ten-lane motorways down which individuals, firms and governments race in their search to sustain profits, growth um, or technological dominance in some cases. So, Alongside these, we also recognise that there are very different um, individuals and communities starting from completely uh, opposite or completely different points and taking very different routes in the direction of sustainability. And we argue, we think that it's important for us to pay equal attention not only to the motorways but also to the bush paths and the mountain trails that draw upon the knowledge and the creativity in those communities to carry them collectively towards a more environmentally sustainable, just and prosperous future. And it's these hidden pathways, in keeping with the theme of the event today, that I'm going to be talking about. What I'd like to do is to share some of our experiences in the Step Centre of highlighting these hidden pathways to sustainability. I'd also like to try and convince you that if we only got better at identifying these hidden pathways, at understanding them and at nurturing them, then we could, as a global community, become better at working together towards our shared sustainability goals. So there are plenty of examples that I could draw upon from Brighton. In fact, we've um, showed a number of them and come across a number of them in our work here, but rather than focus locally, where I know that there's all kinds of interesting things going on. I'm going to take you on a trip, firstly to India, where we've been working uh, with NGOs and researchers just outside Delhi, and then secondly to Kenya. The first example, uh, or the first place I'm going to take you to, is a village just outside Delhi, where we've been looking at a key sustainability issue. That is the availability of water as it serves agriculture. And 
we're going to be uh, learning about the ways in which communities have come together in order to collect and manage their wastewater in order to irrigate their lands in a very challenging situation where the government is actually providing insufficient support. So first we'll just hear the perspectives on this from uh, one of the villagers. My name is Kiran Singh. I live in Karada. I live in district Gajibad. I have five acres of land. We plant vegetables, we plant vegetables, and we plant vegetables. मुझे इस जमीन पर खेती करते हुए तीस साल हो गए अपने ही ट्रैक्टर से ही इंतजाम करते हैं जनरेटर वगैरह मोटर लगी हुई है समर्थन खेती के काम के लिए ना तो कोई मतलब कनेक्शन दिया किसानों को और ना कोई सरकारी ट्यूबवेल लगा और जो पानी की सुविधा करी है गांव वालों ने वो अपने तरीके से करी है किसी ने बोरिंग करा किसी ने समरसिविल लगा और जो गांव का पानी जाता कुछ लोग इससे करते हैं ये गांव से गांव के अंदर नाली बनी हुई है उनसे जाके नीचे में जहाँ पे पानी निकलता खेत में वो वहाँ पे कच्ची नालियाँ बनाकर खेतों में पहुँचाया जाता ये तो जिस फसल को देना देते हैं वो सेहत के लिए नुकसान देती है शरीर के लिए हानिकारक है और वाटर लेवल जो ख़त्म हो रहा है दिन पे दिन जी इसलिए खेती होएगी नहीं क्योंकि पानी की कोई सुविधा नहीं है सो व्हाट वी लर्न फ्रॉम दिस फ्रॉम करण सिंह इज दैट डिस्पाइट सम इंस्टेंसेस वेयर कम्युनिटीज पुल टुगेदर ट्राई एंड वर्क आउट देयर ओन पाथवेज टू सस्टेनेबिलिटी इन मेनी केसेस दीस आर अंडरमाइंड बाय मोर पावरफुल uh, institutions. If you uh, watch the rest of the video which is available on the Steps website, you'd hear him talking about huge tube wells that have been sunk near his community to take water to supply the urban communities, not too far away, but obviously that reduces the water level and has a huge impact, as you can see, on his uh, community, forcing them to adopt these pathways which are problematic in and the health sense. So the question really is, how do we get these powerful actors, the people who, are, who have the potential to build these motorways and influence the lives of people like these communities, how do we get them to understand the situations in which Karen Singh is living? And how do we get them to understand uh, the perspectives that they hold about their own pathways to sustainability? That's one of the uh, uh, key challenges that we face at the STEP Centre. We need to be able to compare these motorways and these bush paths or mountain trails, um, but not necessarily on the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, on the basis of how the um, powerful actors see them and understand them, but on the basis of the, uh, the actual um, the hidden pathways, those who are creating those hidden pathways, how they understand uh, their, um, the different options. Um, th so the second case that I'm going to take you to, again, it looks at agriculture. Um, but this time, rather than looking at water, we're going to be focusing on seeds, and we're going to focus on other strategies for agricultural livelihoods. Again, what we're talking about here is sustaining the harvest, not necessarily sus uh, in the immediate mind of these people, sustaining it over the whole huge long term, decades into the future, but in many cases you're talking about season by season, food on the table week by week. That's sustainability um, in many people's minds. In Kenya, 
Food security is really dominated in the debates around maize. It's unsurprising when you consider that the government has to import millions of dollars of maize uh, periodically in order to avert looming food crises. Uh, and within this maize uh, pathway, really, the, the broader maize pathway, there's what we would call a formal pathway and an informal pathway. The formal one, driven by government investment and also uh, international donors, um, but also supported by the majority of farmers in Kenya, focuses on maize and improving the seed through science and technological research in research stations and then taking it out at the beginning of every season for distribution to the farmers. Now, alongside that, there's another pathway, perhaps likened to a bush path, uh, as a, in contrast to the maize monoculture motorway, in which farmers themselves select their seed on the basis of its performance every year and then save it for use in the following season. So you've got these different pathways which are um, representing different options for maize security in Kenya. The next video I'm going to show you uh, illustrates that people are aware of these different pathways and in some cases are thinking about how to integrate them best so that the benefits from both uh, can actually be taken forward to serve Kenya's maize security. So we're going to hear first from Joseph Wakunda, who's been working on agriculture and biotechnology and food security in Kenya for many years. And then secondly, from Florence Nzetu, who is a seed farmer, um, seed saver in Sakai province. The future of the seed sector, particularly here in Kenya, I think lies in where they have got to integrate both the informal seed sector together with the formal seed sector. And this can only be done by the researchers, that is the public institutions, particularly the research, institu research uh, uh, stations, coming down to the communities and be able to initiate the production of the standard seed, which will then be able to actually stimulate the production towards the formal seed sector. And the standard seed is not necessarily certified seed but it's seed that is actually better than the informal seed, which actually is produced locally without any improvements. You know, the standard seed will give them better yields and they will be able probably to sell and have enough food uh, within their homes and their livelihoods will actually improve. Kwa hivyo ningeuliza wote wanauziga na mbegu kama mahindi wangefanya tuwa na watu wa seed selector wawa kwa kijiji kutoka chini sababu sirikali ya ifiki ule mwana inji wa chini kama tungepato wa saidisi ugeona watu wengi ama tungepato wa saidisi tuka fundisha watu kuhivadhi hizi mbego hizi mbego ya maindi uwezi ikaisha kwa watu wetu So obviously in the Kenyan maize context there are very different perspectives on food security and indeed on sustainability. So the question here is really how do we start thinking about the benefits of some, benefits of others. We know that the seed saving approach produces diverse, diverse seed stocks, sometimes can help in changing climatic conditions and other conditions, <coughs> produces cheaper seed available in remote areas, but the improved seed has better yields, higher quality control, uh, even if sometimes it's diff more difficult to get hold of. Now, in trying to assess these two different pathways, the traditional approach would be for researchers like us or policymakers to go in and identify the pathways ourselves, identify the different options, and also to identify the criteria upon which those options are assessed. How do we decide what's better and what's worse? The researchers could go in and say yield, cost, other kinds of 
uh, characteristics would determine our decision. And those are important. You know, those kinds of uh, technical issues are important. And um, we need to get better at those. But also, some of these traditional quantitative technical approaches also neglect some of the perspectives of people like Florence or um, users of the technologies. And so the STEP Centre is trying to develop methods with its colleagues around the world that try not only to look at the technical side, but also to integrate and incorporate some of the perspectives of technology users in weighing up different pathways. Now, one of the methods, in fact, the one that's being used in this project, the Maze project, was developed by our colleagues at Sussex, particularly Andy Sterling, which is called multi-criteria mapping, or MCM. And the benefit of this method is that rather than us going in with options and pathways, we actually engage different farmers, communities, researchers, policymakers at the local and national level, and we ask them what they think the most relevant pathways are. And what we found is that pathways within maize are one way forward, but actually, there's a much wider um, range of pathways available to these farmers and also to Kenya um, at, the, at the national level. So um, when, we've, when we conducted interviews with these different stakeholders, rather than focusing on the formal, informal uh, pathways, we actually ended up with a total of nine including other crops, including cash crops, other non-maize staples which are better at resisting drought. Rather than just looking at a small number of criteria, yield, cost, uh, disease tolerance, for example, when we opened it up and we asked all of the people involved, we actually ended up with 147 different criteria, which could be used to judge which pathways are favoured by these different groups, not so that we can work on one answer, but really so that we can understand the different perspectives better and why the different groups show these preferences. We can feed that information then to the political decision makers who have a much broader knowledge base upon which to make their decisions. So here we're talking about not only the technical aspects, but also socioeconomic aspects. And that includes whether or not knowledge and capabilities are available at the local level to run these kinds of um, pathways, to, to actually adopt these new kinds of crops. So the STEP Centre conducts these kinds of analysis and tries to uh, work on case studies like this, but we realise that what really needs to happen is these bush paths are going to be uh, identified, widened, improved and linked up to the motorways is a political process. So... For um, an academic organisation, we've gone outside our comfort zone and rather than just focusing on research and case studies, we actually put together a manifesto on innovation. Not only here at Sussex, but also drawing on discussions amongst students here, but also in Brighton, and also policy researchers in Cali, Colombia, um, women in rural Maharashtra, uh, science and technology policy experts in Beijing, 20 roundtables around the world uh, fed into this project. And the manifesto itself asks for a new global politics to innovation. We put forward a 3D agenda, what we call a 3D agenda. The first D is a plea for us to focus less on the scale or pace of innovation and more on the direction in which it's going towards sustainability goals. The second D is to pay more attention to the equitable distribution of the costs, benefits and risks associated with innovation. And the third D is really recognising the importance of a diversity of innovation pathways. So not just building more motorways, but also linking up and identifying the mountain trails and the bush paths so that not just myself, yourself, but also people like Florence, Joseph, Karan, can work together better to realise our shared sustainability goals. Thank you. <laughs>